today. Uh, my guest today is the author Harriet Barrett. Harriet, thank you very much for coming along and talking to me today. Have you been watching the World Cup? Oh yes, definitely. It's not quite as exciting, perhaps, as we hoped it would be, but as it progresses, I think we're getting drawn more and more into it, particularly with all the upsets. What have you um, What have you made of England in the tournament, Iran, and then obviously the USA match? It was wonderful the first match because with England, you never know which England is going to turn up, and it was just such a relief. You know what it's like when you're watching England playing. It was just such a relief to see them playing so positively and fluidly, fluently. And then, of course, against the US, they reverted to the rather static, plodding, rather boring England. And you thought, oh, no, what went wrong? It's the same, same team. Did you... Uh... This is just talking, because this is something I made an episode about, the lack of substitutions and the oh. lack of changing and trying to be trying to win the game. That was the thing that I found most frustrating, is the Americans wanted it more. And I'm worried, yes. you see how Fr France and Brazil and some of the other teams are going for it, and England seem to sit back, waiting for something to happen, just passing it sideways. And then um, it, ne it never happened. And it looked like the Americans were going to score. I just I couldn't believe that they went from being so front-footed to being so defensive in one game. Yes, is it possibly psychological that playing against Iran, maybe England felt confident because they were much higher placed in the rankings, not that that necessarily counts for very much. Maybe they were a bit frit against <laughs> the US, I don't know. It, it's hard to say. But do you, doesn't it come from the coach? Doesn't it come yes. from Gareth? So if you want the, the players to go out there, express themselves and play a high line and press like they did against Iran, surely against the US, the, the opposite message has come from him as well. That was what everyone was scared about before the tournament, that England were going to be too passive and too... You look at France against Denmark. Denmark had a five-minute period and they scored. And the French immediately well, went straight back on the front mm. foot. To, whereas England, you just get the feeling they would have sat back and taken the draw. It just... Yes... And the moment they come up against a decent side, it's going to bite them in the... Yes. Just like against Croatia, just like yes. against Italy. Yes, this is true. And we do, somehow, we seem to get quite good draws, don't we? We seem to be blessed. Not that I'm saying anything. But, uh, yes, when we come against up against quality, or just energy, and, you know, the can-do attitude of Americans. Well, but still, they would have prepared for that. They would have known. So yeah, I think it, it does come back to England, the coach. England aside, before this becomes depressing, uh, <laughs> so, who have you been enamoured with, either player or team? Who, who's caught, caught your eye or who do you think are, oh, they might be either team or player. Of the t obviously, Mbappe will be up there. But yeah. which team has kind of, or teams do you... I loved watching France, Spain, and of course Brazil. Uh, just wonderful flowing football. I was very impressed with France. I thought they were very chic, very stylish. And Spain, again, you, you don't always know what you're going to get with Spain, do you? But they came out all guns blazing, a bit like England did against Iran. So yes, France, Spain, and Brazil uh, have definitely That's caught our imagination. Quite, quite funny one there, because that mirrors our group. So if you look at Spain in the first game against Costa Rica, Costa Rica showed absolutely nothing in that game. They've now come out and won today against Japan, yes. one 0 Which you could argue, does that show that Costa Rica are better than they were, or does it show that Spain were really, really, really good? Now, of course, they've got the the Germany match, similar to England versus Wales. So you've got yes. that barometer of how good are Spain, because they played against a no-one who didn't try, a bit like England. Yes. They've come up against somebody semi-decent, or they will be with Germany. England stuttered. So this would be like a good barometer test for yes. the Spanish. Yes. I think Spain has got the confidence, though. Germany... 
who knows? Uh, you know, they've got to play against Germany. But it would be very interesting to see Spain against France, say. There's two. That's going if I think, I think. Would that happen? That would be a semi final, I think. I think <coughs> the way the draw is going, yes. I'm just trying to remember now. I think we play France in the quarters, I think. It all depends on who wins what group. It has an effect yes. on how it all permutates. But I think we might play Spain in the semis. I think France might play Brazil in the final, if it got that far. That would be a good final. That would be wonderful. That would be yes. Mbappe against Neymar, P PSG. PSG on PSG. Yes. <laughs> and I have to ask you, obviously semi-World Cup related, Ronaldo, the Ronaldo interview, you can't escape it. I did a couple of videos on it, everyone's done a video on it. Um, what were your thoughts about the interview? Was it right, should he have done it, what he said? You can't escape it, the topic coming into the World Cup, what did you think about it? It's a difficult one, isn't it? Uh, because he's putting his point of view, and you're not being given the other side's point of view at all. It definitely hasn't worked out. I think most players would be rather aghast at the idea of going public like that, though, because normally it's behind closed doors. You don't come out like that. Yeah, it's, it's, me. Funny, it's funny you say that, because he <coughs> he was mentored by Sir Alex Ferguson, and his big thing was no. keeping things in the dressing room. On the stuff that he said, you, you said it was his opinion. Did you agree with what he said? Did you not agree? Did you believe with some of the points that he made? Did you, because he came out quite scathing. <laughs> Do you think he had credibility? Did you believe what he said, most of all? It's very hard, isn't it? Because I think he's the sort of player... I mean, he is used to being at the centre of everything, and he has been sidelined. But is that the manager, or is that the fact that he's just not playing the sort of role that Ten Hag wants for his team. You know, that he doesn't want to set his team up around Ronaldo. That's the problem. But with the, on the point of, okay, feeling hard done by, but on the point of he said the owners, first of all, he said the manager disrespected him, he did it on purpose, he wanted to humiliate him. But then secondly, on the owners with the football club, did you believe, he didn't name any names, but did you believe those accusations that they didn't have the interest? Was he speaking the truth or was he just doing it as a means to kind of get sacked, for want of a better term? I, I found it difficult to believe. <laughs> First of all, I mean, he, he's such a star player. And, you know, I mean, the, the, he's just in a sort of stratosphere. And so it, it didn't really sound very convincing to me, no. Because it's funny you say that, and the reason I bring that up is because it's entirely around the predicate of how your books are sort of written and pitched. You have a narrative, and if that narrative is something that you necessarily don't believe, whether it's how they arrive at their conclusion or the conclusion itself, you've written or you've spent your, your time in the books that you've released challenging that view. That's and that is kind of funny, and that's why I want to get your opinion on the Ronaldo interview. What was it about challenging conception that kind of made you inclined to want to write a book in the first place, rather than just believe what you're fed? You wanted not just to disbelieve it; you actually felt compelled to put something out there to challenge that view or that narrative. I like to make sense of things, so if if something doesn't make sense, then you want to sort of find out what's going on, as it were. And in the case of the megalithic empire, you've got all these huge great stones. I mean, obviously the most famous uh, monument, if you like, is Stonehenge. But there's loads, there's loads and loads of, of stone circles and stone rows and they're big, that's why they're called megaliths. So somebody goes to a lot of trouble to put to put them up and place them in a certain way. And there's been so much 
speculation. And usually what happens with historians is if they don't understand something, they don't say, we don't know. They just say, oh, it's for ritual purposes. In other words, it's somehow, you can't understand it because it's a different mindset, a different religion, if you like, or culture. And that sort of covers everything. And you look at it and you think, well, there's nothing religious about them necessarily at all. I mean, it's like saying, oh, we found a an old building. It must be a temple. You have no idea what it was. All you can say is that there was a building here once upon a time. You found the foundations. There's nothing to say it was a temple or a church. It's the same with these stones. You can't just point to them and say, oh, well, they put them up like a sort of uh, somehow, you know, ask, asking the gods to protect them or whatever, or for a good harvest. That was another one. They thought that Stonehenge was a calendar of some so sort. So in, in the case of the stones, they create a narrative or an explanation to fit a hole because they don't know. They don't want to say that they don't know. They, they don't have any record. It's before they had any kind of legible writings which they can date to the time. You've got this really great big thing in the middle of England and others dotted around. They don't understand how or why they're there. <laughs> so they make up a narrative because it's the go-to argument to fill a hole because they can't turn around and say, we don't know. That would be the end of the line. So they have to put something in to fit what they're... Yeah, so in the middle of Salisbury Plain, you've got Stonehenge, say, and they sort of, they think it was a, well, there's various theories. One is that it was an agricultural calendar, so people would know when to sow the harvest. Yes, yeah, so and for anyone who doesn't know, so if you don't know the geography of England, you know that um, England's a funny shaped country, it's kind of got like a little boot at the bottom, which is where Cornwall is, and then you've got London, which is in the south. And then sort of slap bang in the middle of England from east and west, from where London, if you keep going westerly, you'll hit Bristol. Pretty much equidistant. Yeah. You've got this county called Wiltshire, or Wiltshire, if you are in uh, <laughs> North American <laughs> territories. And yeah. it's all open, it's all vast, it's all farmland, it's And fields, it's flat. And it's flat. Whether it's naturally flat or whether it was made that's flat, the that's, point. A, that's, a, yes, that's that the point. Nobody but, would sort of know. This is the other problem is... That you're talking about thousands of years ago. It, you're talking about, uh, let's say, 3000 BC. So you're talking so about 5,000 5, 6, five or 6,000 years ago. Since when all sorts of activities have been going on. So you can't say whether something is natural or man made. But the point being, not always. But the point being, it's in the middle of what we would call nowhere. You've got, you had a, in the middle of a plain. In yes. the middle of a plain. So you had settlements, doesn't matter what they are, doesn't matter if they exist or not, but you had little tells or you had little forts, you had places where people were congregated. But basically, from, from what we can tell, this area was open, it was flat at that time. So right bang in the middle of nowhere, you've got this great big construct away from civilization away from permanent habitation, you've just got this ruddy great big thing, and people just didn't know. So, so, And there were lots and lots of stone circles, though. There were, well, nobody knows how many there were, because some of them have been destroyed or fallen down. The Stonehenge has been reconstructed, so, so some of the stones <coughs> had fallen down, and they had to put them back up again. That, 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 that's the thing, so that's, that's part of the, go back to that original narrative, is you've got this structure, doesn't matter how they date it, it's a bit like the city of Troy, where you've got Troy 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You've got this thing, whether it's the original thing or not, you've got this thing, which they can't explain, and so they come up with a narrative, and the reason why this thing might have been rebuilt many times could have changed down the years, but the point being is they don't know, so they come up with something, and that is what people are fed, whether it's on TV or whether it's in school. People are taught this narrative that there's a really great collection of stones, the most famous of which is Stonehenge. They don't really know what it was for, why or how, why it was where it, where it is, or what it was for. So they come up with an excuse, and you're just pigeon fed that sort of parrot fodder, for want of a better term. You have yes. I mean some some of the things that I mean we're talking <laughs> about 
famous archaeologists and historians, and you see them on television, and they will say things like, oh, it's to honour the dead, to honour the ancestors. I mean, and this like, all, a, like a tomb or like a... Like uh, a... So, so, something like that, yeah, it's like a... I suppose a sarcophagus or some kind of funerary uh, memorial or something. And, uh, but there's no evidence for that. I mean, some of the, you know, if 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 you or I or somebody else sort of came up with these theories, you'd be laughed out of court. It's only because they happen to be, you know, have the right letters after their name that people don't laugh at it's them. It's quite interesting because on the back, what you've done is because you don't just talk about stone age, you talk about an entire empire, almost like a civilization which spans Europe, and I don't know if you can see that here, but again I will include the link. Yes, because we don't just have megaliths in this country. Yes. No, very true. So I'll, yeah. I'll include the link um, where you can buy a copy of this, but they're all over Europe. So it's not just Stonehenge, although that's arguably the most famous, they're all over Europe. So it's a network of these things. I mean, they didn't all sprout up at the same time, and we don't even know if they were for the same reason, but they're all grouped together, and we're just fed this this fodder, which they, they, I guess, I don't want to say they've just made up, but they don't really know why. They just, they feed it to us as a line to feed to us, and we're expected to believe it. That's true. I, and I don't actually mind if you have a discussion and somebody says, well, no, you must be wrong because this or that we've discovered in the meantime. What happens, though, is if you are not an expert, if you don't have the right letters after your name, nobody's even going to listen to you in the first place. So, so the letters after your name give you the right to be on a high horse and say what you want to say, even if you've got no basis for that. The fact that you've got those letters gives you the credence. doesn't matter if what you say sounds correct, could be disproven. You've got those letters, so you're given the, 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 the platform to get your opinion across. And because others in your realm with the same letters concur, that becomes the de facto explanation. But you wouldn't be an expert if you were spouting what they sort of think of as fruitcake ideas, because you have got to go through university, you've got to go through all the ho hoops in order to get those letters So you have to name. conform to yeah. a narrative yeah. and a passage that they say to be able to get into a position to continue to perpetuate whatever it was to get you into that position. And the moment that you change that direction, you're castigated, yes. excommunicado. You can only go off-piste, as it were, once you're famous. Once you have got your master's or your PhD and you've done... You've had to publish papers which have to be peer-reviewed, so everybody's got to be singing from the same hymn sheet. You can't start having crazy ideas and get a PhD. So, you, as you say, you conform. So, you know, if you become a sort of grand old dame or grand old master, and, you know, you, you are then have perhaps more liberty to uh, explore other ideas, if you, if you wish. But yes, in general, you are not allowed to go have alternative ideas. And they, academics always say that they are exploring things and researching things. But actually, when they publish papers, they have to stick to the script, as it were. They can't, they can't just come out with... Uh, different ideas. They can't say, oh, we got it all wrong. That's the problem. You can't say you were wrong. So the question would be, you have an inquisitive mind and you don't just believe what you're fed. So you don't believe what you read in the newspapers type um, anagram as, as, as the story goes. And you don't necessarily believe what these people with their letters after their name are spouting. What was it about Stonehenge in particular, or Stonehenge type megaliths that, that really, I guess, inspired you to write something that would go against that grain. Because Stonehenge has got, it's famous worldwide, UNESCO World Heritage Site, it, in, it incites almost Lord of the Rings-esque um, mystique, because nobody knows, and because it's so old, and because it's in the middle of nowhere, 
but most people would, would wonder in their mind would ask questions but you've gone that step further you wanted to write about it you wanted to challenge that narrative you wanted to go against that grain what was it about Stonehenge that made you think to undergo that process well funnily enough it probably wasn't really anything to do with Stonehenge or even Megalith that started this in the first place the original question as it were was how did people get around because back we're talking now about say 5,000 years ago and you were just saying to your listeners about Cornwall being the boot down in the southwest. No offence to any Cornish people watching or listening. Cornwall was the beating heart, was the industrial heart of England and Devon, Cornwall and Devon, because of the tin trade. I mean, we... So they were, they were, they were basically extracting the materials and, and transporting it, it, it to the yes, country. They were, yes, it wasn't sort of deep mining, it, it was surface mining, but the tin, tin which was it's actually relatively rare, much much rarer than, say, copper or iron. And Cornwall is, was, was absolutely massive, Devon and Cornwall. So this is how it all started, was, well, you wouldn't have had a Bronze Age without tin because bronze is about 10% tin. So you can't, you, you've got, it, it's an amalgam of copper and tin. So the, so the question was, well, how did tin from Cornwall get right across, not just England, but internationally, because it was being transported right across to, you know, across the channel. So what was the transport system? And that's how it all started, because they were, there's all these sort of ideas, oh, well, it's a bit like um, peddlers. You know, carry your your knapsack over your back, or get your donkey to carry it for you, and sort of fits and starts. So it would be a very long, laborious sort of process of going a certain distance and then handing over to the next man. And God knows, it must have taken years and years and years to get anywhere. But it doesn't seem to have been like that at all, because then you look at these old trackways. I suppose you'd call them drovers' routes because people use them for transporting animals as well. Cutting right across England, east, west, north, south, long before the Romans. Is that like the Ridgeway then? Is it, yes, is, is the, ridge, the Ridgeway is sometimes called the oldest road. It's not really a road, it's a trackway. And um, a lot of our current roads were originally... Um, you know, just used for transporting animals. So tin, there, there was a transport system. So then that's when the megaliths sort of came into it because you sort of had these, as it were, signposts because, of course, nobody had, nobody was literate. Nobody had a map. You know, there was no none of the usual uh, written uh, signposts or GPS or anything like that, no maps. So you had to have signs in the landscape, sort of like, you go this way, this way to Birmingham, this way to Coventry. Because that's the other that thing, sort of thing. You because have... you, look at, you look at the geography of England, so you've got Cornwall, which is stuck out in the southwest. Yeah. From Cornwall, um, they always say Land's End to John O'Groats up in Scotland. You're talking six or 650 miles north to south. You're talking a couple of hundred to two to three hundred miles if you're going from West Wales all the way to East Anglia. That's a huge kite-shaped area if you think about it like that. You've got Cornwall and Devon stuck out where you're mining, you're getting these materials. You're getting them to places like Birmingham, which is two or three hundred miles because you can't just go as the crow flies, you have to meander and, and what yeah. have you. You've got Pembrokeshire, you've got the northwest and the northeast where there was activity going on, but then you've got to get to the Channel, which is anywhere from Plymouth, or what did we now have, Southampton, or through Sussex. Then you get it into France, so you've got to navigate the water, which may only be 20 or 30 miles, but what you might have could be very heavy. Could be stone, could be metal, could be... I mean, that's incredible logistic yes. hurdle. When yes. you think about it, and there's 
a lot of all the way down the what they call the Atlantic seaboard from northern France all the way down to the Portuguese coast right down to the tip almost in North Africa you've got all these places where there was trade going on and some of them became sort of centers of pilgrimage you know they they, they became so there's a lot there's a lot to explore there and you've got sort of megalithic engineering I suppose you call it these sort of little like tidal islands that are connected to the mainland almost like what we would call a jetty I suppose there's an awful lot there in the landscape but of course none of it is needed anymore it's all obsolete because now we've got a different type of transport different types of boats so if we look at the back i mean this just gives us a very brief overview and i'll just show it there to the camera you've got all those highlighted areas you've got spain portugal you've got the uk <clears throat> even going as far as scandinavia you're talking about a third the size of the continental united states basically had these structures had this amount of transport going on and we're talking five or six thousand years ago that an area that would cover you know the, the pacific midwest to the pacific coast and to alaska that's the size of the area we're talking where you know you've got 100 150 million people living now this is six thousand years ago with no form of major boats that we know there was no networking navally speaking there was no aircraft there were no cars there was no universal trading language because languages were so dispersed there was no currency because minting of coins and all the rest of it was still well probably predates all of that so the logistical element is gigantic it is i mean they have found uh occasionally evidence like there was um a shipwreck um bay this is in devon and it's just south of dartmoor which is also a tin mining area they found tin ingots but you don't often get i mean you know you're talking about a very long time ago and you don't often get that sort of evidence so a lot of it is speculation but this was going back to your original question this was how the megaliths sort of made their appearance as it were because they're like landmarks they're a bit like signposts so if you're going along you were talking about the ridgeway so if you think of the ridgeway as say the a motorway and every now and then you get signs on the motorway you get slip roads coming leading off and leading in and you've got signposts and it's the megaliths seem to sort of act very much as signposts if you're walking along in the countryside and you don't have a map it's really odd because if you if you're on a trackway and you actually can see where other trackways are meeting and you get these what people call hill forts which are not really forts they're just like big humps and every 10 miles or so you get another one and you sort of think oh well it's a bit like us looking for possibly a hotel or a pub or something like that you know you're you're every or a garage so in, even in, in you know essence, every so often before you had signposts and before you had written language or anything which you could scripture to say 500 yards you'll find whatever <clears throat> you had this turnpike or this intersection to state that once you got to a certain major point you could veer off into a certain direction and that would take you on to another route which would be another major route to the next what would be the next yes. intersection it's almost like junctions on a motorway or yes. a freeway now yes. where you've got major i mean we have spaghetti junction here but there's major intersections in yes. many countries where you can just go off in all sorts of but the question would be if you arrived at one of these and you could be in England today or Scotland tomorrow or France or somewhere else or even Turkey which is more the Middle East how would you know if there was no inscription on the stones which 
because we're only talking about longitudinally speaking, what that would correspond to. Unless this is almost like, and I remember this from when I used to do a lot of selling on the road, I would use uh, landmarks, whether it be a McDonald's and yeah. services or a particular hill, I would know that I was in a particular area and if I needed to go to whatever, I could take the next exit. So would these have represented, if you wanted to go to this major city, use the third stone or the fifth stone, or is that in essence what they were, like a landmark to represent what the exit was for? It sounds quite plausible. I mean, some archaeologists have, uh, have compared a stone circle to a roundabout, so that you sort of take a different... Now, Hence confusing the hell out of everyone even back Yes, then. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I mean, I would have thought that at certain places, such as where you've got, uh, we, we call them a dolmen, or, which is a bit, it looks a bit like a table. You've got a stone on top and you've got supporting stones underneath to keep it, to support the top stone. And you would have like a guide there who could then direct you. So but people you, had to live there permanently? I would have thought it's quite possible that certain times of the year you might have had to live there. If it, you sort of think of hermit's caves, you know, where people would sort of live for uh, a certain amount of time, not necessarily all year round. So, to go back to the point of the book, so it's not so much the fact it was Stonehenge or the fact that there were great big stones just there, it was the logistical element of how you would get stuff that was mined vast, vast different distances, considering you didn't have transportation networks, which kind of plucked your curiosity to want to write something in this vein. Yes. So the next thing would be, what is the general message that they want us to believe I'm talking about from academia now. We were talking about having those letters after your name, having earned your stripes, having written your PhD and your thesis and all the rest of it. What is that message that they try and convey? What Obviously, they don't know, and there's nothing surviving from back then, but what is it that they would have us believe is the reason? And is it the same reason for every single construct? I think when it comes to something like Megalis, the received wisdom is that people couldn't possibly be so well organised, even though they acknowledge that it's a massive undertaking, that you would need an awful lot of people, you know, a lot of labour and a lot of man hours, and they spend a lot of time trying to work out how many man hours and how many months or years it would take to construct something. But the, the idea that there was any kind of organisation or sort of national infrastructure the trans you know connecting the road well, i say road now trackways and the to the to the coast and so on so what what i felt was people haven't changed people are not any stupider in the past than they are now but technology is different. So you just don't have the technology to do things now. So you can't you can't say, oh well, they didn't they couldn't possibly transport uh tin ingots over to Holland because they didn't have the boats. You don't know if they had the boats or not. So basically what so basically what they're saying is you they don't give people from back then enough credit. They assume that they were either stupid or simpletons or didn't have the technology. Therefore, these structures and this network couldn't possibly have existed because people didn't know how to speak or transport or interact or, or effectively have the same kind of constructs that we have today. Therefore, it has to be for a more basic need, which is burying the dead or worshipping something or something of that kind of primitive nature. And that is just what they want to continue to be. And anyone who challenges that is effectively ignored or expelled or they, they, they don't want to veer away from that narrative because it would challenge all of that thinking 
and they would be shown to have no proof to be able to substantiate what they've tried to say, i.e. they can't prove that they couldn't speak or they couldn't interact or they didn't have this transportation or just admit that they don't know. Is that effectively... Yes. Okay, so on that basis then, what's the compelling arguments in, in the book? Because obviously without having gone through those track records, although fairly learned and having gone through university, not being professorial or, or having some form of residency somewhere in the academic circles, why would somebody be compelled to read this or why would they take the methods that you've gone through to disprove what's being said over what the general consensus opinion is? Well, there tend to be sort of like two camps, if you like. You've got the academics who, on the whole, would just say everything is for ritual purposes or, as you say, burying the dead or something like that. And then on the other side, you've got, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, alternative uh, views, which um, tend to, to concentrate very much on spiritual aspects, but more what they call archaeoastronomy. So they think that these uh, all everything has to be aligned, you know, that the as above, so below. So you've got a, a stone circle that is aligned with Orion, say, or, you know, one of... And it points towards sunset at a certain date and so on. Very complicated. I mean, and they never quite explain how anyone would sort of get their head around such a complicated uh, arrangement. The other thing they won't take into account is when it comes to celestial bodies is you don't have perfect circles of orbit. So, but depending on your spin or degree of your spin and where you are in the seasons, objects will, have, will differentiate in the sky. They're not always in the same relationship. So if you had something pointing at Orion's belt now or at Sagittarius or whatever it might be, or a map of the solar system, it might work on a given day of a given month of a given year, but fast forward to a different point, uh, you'll have, a, and also when it comes to the solstices, uh, which, or equinoxes, where longest and shortest days of the year or where the days are, and nights are of equal time, that won't be on the same date of the same month yeah. because of the natural way that things yes. move. So that's, a, it just seems to be a convenient. And why be so complicated? It will, What's it for? That's the point. So if you look at, say, a stone circle or even just a standing stone, you can use it as a compass, assuming that the sun is shining, which you can't always assume in this Or the country. moon and the stars, depending on what time that you're... like. That's you right. So see. you know that when... You know, you, you can tell that you are going in rough... If you know roughly, it doesn't have to be exact... But roughly the right direction, you know that you are generally supposed to be going north or northwest. So you can use the shadow of a stone circle or, or a standing stone as as a sort of compass point. Yes, I I I would go that far. But um, when you get into the sort of archaeo astronomy, it gets very complicated, and I don't know if people really would have studied the solar system in, in quite so much uh, detail anyway. So the question would be in relation to whatever theory you want to pursue, you've got uh, a general narrative that, that you know academia would want to push and then you've got an alternative view irrespective of what that view is. What were the processes or steps that you took to be able to disprove what they're saying to say well I'm saying this, or they're saying that, how would you then potentially find holes in their argument to add credence to what you're saying? What was the research, or how did you find the holes in, in that narrative? I think the way to approach uh, something like uh, megaliths is to link them up, to see a pattern, if you like. So rather than just examining one site, Stonehenge or Karnak or whatever, Avebury or something, if you 
just look at that in isolation, as it were, rather than how it connects to other sites. You, do, you, you don't get the whole picture. So if you're sort of more interested in a, a general transport system rather than individual megalithic sites, then you marry the two up. So it, it's, a, it's a much broad, a, a broad brush picture rather than looking at individual megalithic sites. So if they were to try to say that it had astronomical or burial ritual connotations, how would you disprove those particular points and then argue that what you are proposing has more substance or merit as, a, as something for a reader to kind of back? Well, you get uh, some very big sites where you've got lots of stone rows and they spend ages saying, oh, this stone row points to that particular star or it's aligned with such and such. Karnak in Brittany is one. Merivale on Dartmoor in Devon is another where you've got all these stone rows and of course it doesn't really make any sense at all and you look at these stone rows and you think well they just look like they're stacked up in a row waiting to be collected you know it doesn't necessarily mean that they've been placed there because they are aligned with anything because they're all pointing in different directions anyway and as you said it um it doesn't really um, add up because it, it, it changes over time anyway. I guess the, the thought to take away is that academia don't really have a clue. They come up with a theory which might be astronomical or might be to do with ritual. That of course could change as we said before about what time of year it is, if it's in relation to the stars. It could change over centuries depending on what you believe in, in terms of the rituality of, of life and death. So it makes a lot of sense to try and challenge that kind of belief because they're just making things up to suit whatever story to plug a hole because they can't admit that they don't know. But it's interesting that you come on to that because your, your follow-up book was basically stating, in a similar vein, if we take tapestries or journals or documents that almost make up the fabric of the history of places like the UK or Ireland or other, they in turn might be the same level of crap <laughs> because it could easily be a forgery or it could have been made up or it could have been to suit a narrative of whoever was in power at the time. So what we have in this book, which is talking about the forgeries of documents through time, and again I'll include a link onto this as well, I mean we've got documents which span what you know the very makeup or the core beliefs of say the country of Ireland anecdotes here about the Pope and his visit to Britain and you know the Catholic Church and the Archduke of Canterbury massive massively important post historically in Britain um, we've got instances here where the British Library one of the largest collections of works pay millions of pounds for supposedly important religious texts and you know in the annals of history some of the major references when trying to compile a history of the country and we talk about was it a whole was it a hoax was it a forgery have they basically been conned so it's interesting that you go from the conjecture about whether people were or were not stupid or had the ability infrastructurally to and logistics to the, some of the very fabric which makes up the history or the narratives of countries themselves i mean it seems a huge potentially combustible topic to want to try and get into. Why did you want to sort of tackle that? I think it all started because uh, historians don't have very much evidence of what was going on in the Dark Ages. They don't like to call it the Dark Ages, they prefer to call it the Early Medieval Age, but it, it's, it was called the Dark Ages because it was there was no writing and then they sort of discovered all these charters land charters and it would be king so-and-so granted the bishop of 
so and so such so -and -so, or land holdings and these charters have never been actually dated and I this I started thinking well most of them are understood to be forgeries there's no question even even historians agreed that there's a huge number of forgeries so then you think well if that's a forgery why isn't the one next to it a forgery because none of them have actually been dated and they're all in favor of uh, a certain abbey or church getting its hands on a certain amount of land and of course the only people who could write were monks but going back to the original point there when you were talking about it was called a dark age because people couldn't write so we know that writing was around a long long time ago whether it was in the middle east or whether it was in china are we saying that it hadn't arrived here or are we saying it had but whatever was here before had been ripped up to suit the narrative of whoever coming con you know conquered the land or are we saying that people were stupid here how how did we get to a point where multiple places in the world at this point have the ability to write they've got parchment there's enough whether they are rich or or learned to be able to write down yet in this area of the, of the world there doesn't appear to be any record is it because it hadn't arrived here or is it because it had and it had been ripped up to suit subsequent narratives later there was certainly writing in the roman period because the romans were literate so they brought writing with them there may well have been some kind of system i mean you're talking about early writing in i don't know say babylonia or somewhere very crude very primitive it's sort of it's like lists inventories so there may well have been something like that but here there were jokes as, as well. well one of the earliest forms of writing is a joke yes so it's not just to say one two skip a few 99 100 it was a joke so there was but there was also diaries they found records of infidelity they found records of infertility they found records of infant death they found records not just of war there's a receipt people are trying to haggle over and i'm not trying to make a middle eastern stereotype about haggling over money but it's it's something that we do everywhere there's disputes about money there's even rec references back then of initiating primitive court yeah. proceedings so e even if it's basic literacy or humor or irony or whatever why is there no record of that on a contemporary basis over here well i suppose we all sort of seem to agree that the middle east is the cradle of civilization this is where it all began and um the rest of us were sort of rather barbaric and uncivilized um you certainly like the england fans of the world cup <laughs> yeah it's something like that <laughs> England, yes. However, when it comes to trade, which was international, we know that because of the tin trade, for example, there must have been a system of communication. And it could well be the Phoenicians were, as it were, like the middlemen because of, of the alphabet, the ph phonetics comes from Phoenician. So in that... There, there may well it may well be that there was a class of people who had to be literate and numerate but you know why would somebody who has a farm need to be literate or numerate so you know a lot of it is whether it's actually necessary or not whether it's but if you, if it, on, the, on the previous point we were talking about other regions so we're talking about the Middle East, or we're talking about the Far East, they needed to obviously be literate. We took, we spoke about trade before. We've spoken about the network that existed to ma maneuver things around. So there had to be a level of literacy, at least orally, to be able to communicate. But how do you keep a record of who's paid what, or what's worth what, or what the route might be if you can't write anything down? And we're talking about at the time now of megaliths and afterwards, before the Romans came, because. How would you have been able to keep a record of how many bits of tin or bits of wood or stones or whatever or if you're haggling over something or there's a dispute you have to be able to write that down to keep a record 
So surely there would have been the same people in society here as there were in other parts of the world with the same need to be able to write things down. I agree, but there's no evidence of it. I mean, we so is it possible have baked clay tablets. Okay, but is it possible that there was some form of literacy, even if it was in pockets, if it was regionalised and localised to very few who could instigate the trade, and then subsequent people, whether it be Romans or others, found those records, and or even later, and have got rid of that because it might break the narrative that they were trying to... Because history is written by the winners. If you find something which might break what you're trying to write, could they have destroyed that? It's possible, but I mean, a lot of a lot of history seems to have got stretched out in you know sort of periods where nothing very much is happening. Um, whether these are sort of valid periods or not, we don't know because. The so-called records are written much, much later. So, for instance, going after the Romans left, you have the Anglo-Saxon period. Well, the only record you have is, say, the Anglo-Saxon chronicles, but they weren't written until the 12th century. So, they're talking about events that happened hundreds of years ago okay, you know, so and then nobody nobody so recorded so them. So just to fill in the gap there for anyone who doesn't know, up until around just after say Christ, first century, you had a load of people here, you can call them what you want, history calls them Celts and, and other bits and pieces, you then had the Romans who basically invaded and took over Britain up to where England and Scotland meet, you had Hadrian's Wall, west towards where, uh, where Wales were and, and generally speaking it's considered consensus that the Romans took over Britain and for a few hundred years we were Romanized from around the first century until I think the last remnants of Roman times here was I don't know four or five hundred AD or whatever and then the general narrative is almost immediately after they left nobody basically took Britain by the by the horns Germanics and Angles came in from Denmark and Germany or whatever which we call the Anglo-Saxons hence Angolan or Ang England later and you had almost a Germanic takeover of Britain for centuries with a little bit of Norse invasion. So we have this Anglo-Saxon period for the second half of that first millennium. That's a general, very, very basic narrative, but we don't have anything from that time to say, oh yeah, so so-and-so has come in. The only thing that we have is records looking back to say that such and such dynasties existed or so-and-so existed. But what we're saying is those records were written much, much later, centuries later, so that anything that might have been and gone, there is nothing that they can base that on because there was nothing written at the time. They've almost made uh, a chronicle centuries after that had happened. And your argument here in, the, in, your, in your book is those chronicles themselves and other works are no different to what you're saying there, that it was written by people to suit a narrative, probably money, power, wealth, influence, and what we are now using those those documents for are no less a hoax or no yeah. less a forgery or no less incentivized than that period that things were written about when there was no one here to, to ask and say, oh yeah, is this true or is that true? We, we're taking at face value these documents and it's taken someone like yourself to say, well, I don't believe that in essence. But you can't treat them as history. You can't treat the Anglo-Saxon chronicles as history because they were written, as I say, centuries later. So they're not they're not what historians call primary sources. Primary sources just means documents that were written at the time. And the way that they do that is they, they grab them, they have them in their possession, they can do some form of scientific analysis to have a look at the type of parchment, the ink or the inscription or whatever it might be to be able to date it to that period to say it was either contemporary or not contemporary as to when these events took place. You know? Yes, yes. But, I mean, we know that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles were written much later. Uh, the I think the earliest manuscript is dated something like 1120. And that's, something. again, down to it was in a monastery because they were the few people who could actually write. 
and it's down to the puzzle of the ink and how the ink is set into the paper and the paper itself, there's, there's techniques which aren't disputed to basically state that this was written in a particular epoch and that epoch came later than the period that we know from other forms of dating, therefore it couldn't have been at the same time. So that's pretty much established. Uh, historians would say, yes, you can date it by the style, the style of writing. And you think, but the style of writing can be any period. I mean, anyone can write in a certain style. You know, so if you had an original document, science. you can copy that. You can, you, like, like people. Well, there the isn't an original document. I mean, the earliest document you have is the manuscript that, let's say, the British Library has. Now, historians will say, okay, it's a 12th century charter or chronicle or whatever. But as you say, oh, it must be based on a an earlier copy. But there isn't an earlier copy. Unless you can produce an earlier copy, you can't say it existed because you haven't got it. You have no evidence. Or if you have evidence that there are other documents talking about it, you know, so and so showed me his copy that he did yesterday you know you, you've got independent verification that it existed but if you haven't got that you can't say that there was an earlier copy if you haven't got it so this has obviously happened time and time over so we've spoken about anglo-saxon chronicles and obviously the book covers many others you, you we spoke about the pope's visit um and it brings into dispute you know um accounts from the archbishop of canterbury um, some of Ireland's most famous scripture is in there. What is, is it the same entities who are um, creating the narratives of these documents? And if so, what are the purposes or the underlying reasons for creating such a false narrative around these documents and how important they place them? When the Normans arrived, they introduced monasteries and built churches. So they are creating a sort of class, if you like, of literate people who are loyal to the king. The wealth of the monasteries, you're talking about monastic orders, the Benedictines and, and the Cistercians are probably the most famous, and you've got other orders as well, the Augustinians and so on, they need land because they're basically farming, most of them, sheep farming, but they're also producing literature and they are safeguarding their entitlement, as they would see it, to land. Now, everybody knows that they forged things but as I said but earlier you know that historians understand this but they don't understand the reason behind it which is to safeguard your land holdings and you will get a really holy book a sort of a gospel book and inside the gospel book you'll find a charter and guess what it says such and such a monastery is entitled to so many hectares of land and this is in a holy book you know so it must be as it were the will of god it's sacrosanct so that that's how they as it were established their rights so there's a couple of questions then so again for anyone who doesn't know if we go back to britain the romans leave midway through the first millennium the invasion, if it was an invasion of the Normans within 1066, which is pretty much universally accepted, we're talking five or six hundred years of Britain effectively being in a quagmire of incestuous infighting or, or claim and counterclaim and, and, and what have you. We're saying that there was no remnants of Christianity despite the Romans being Christians themselves. So no temples, no places to worship, no sculptures about Jesus or Virgin Mary or, or anything of that nature and so the Normans took it upon themselves after invading bear in mind that the Normans themselves are only here for a couple of centuries themselves they are the ones who built the first churches 
there's no remnants of Christianity here before they rock up. And in order to, I guess, perpetuate that narrative and to protect the church as they're building, they are creating these scriptures to say that they have an entitlement to the land. But why would the king, whether it's William the Conqueror, his descendants, who have an absolute monarchy at this point in time, this is pre-Magna Carta, why would he just not grant that church or that church or whatever a right to land and wealth? Why does it have to go through a fabrication of documents for the church to have an entitlement to what they're saying? William <coughs> owned all the land in England. It, it was his kingdom. So anybody who, you know, we've got sort of famous knights who came over from Normandy and anybody who was loyal to him would be rewarded with land, with estates. The church, which was just about sort of being established, had to establish its rights. So if they could show in writing that their claims went back five or six hundred years or however many years centuries it was then that would sort of <coughs> enable them to hang on to their land and also say well actually uh, King Ethelred said in a, we could have this amount of land and that bit over there belongs to us as well don't you know so if we go back so if we just go back a step then so we were talking about literacy so it may well be, and I go back to the point I raised before, so it may well be that there was literacy here, that there were parchments, and there was a similar division of wealth and land in Anglo-Saxon times. We'll call it Anglo-Saxon times for the moment. where, And we know that there were fables told around the time of Beowulf and all the rest of it. Yet there's no talking about Christianity. There's no talking about gods. There's no Norse gods worship here, or there's no Christianity worship that we'd have found. So is it possible that the Normans found remnants of this, crushed it to then substantiate their subsequent claim that, oh no, they, they, they didn't worship their own gods or they didn't have their own establishment of an order. Actually, it was our church, our branch of Christianity, the Norman church. Therefore, we have the historic right. Could be. You'd have to, uh, you'd have to find archaeological traces. And the problem is, that you get a lot of churches that say they were built on the site of an earlier church which doesn't exist anymore. We don't have a single Anglo-Saxon church in this country. Although archaeologists will say, oh, but this church has got a little bit of Anglo-Saxon fragments of stone in it or a cross, a Saxon cross. Well, of course, you, know, you can't date a stone cross. A so the question would be, let's go before 1066, what was the religion and what was the division or the right? Because we know in pretty much every culture, whether it be Native Americans or whether it be in China or the Middle East, the holy entity of your civilization had great power because obviously it was the fake news of the time. So people didn't have science or education, they weren't learned. If something happened, if a great tidal wave came out of the sea, the easiest explanation is for the holy man to come and say it's an act of God. You have to do this now, it will happen again. And people, of course, would obey. So what did the Anglo-Saxons believe for half a millennium before the Normans came? You had the Romans who had gone through a period of believing umpteen gods and then went through a Christianity cleanse. Now they believe in Jesus and all the rest of it. Eventually that would have made its way across their empire. What was it that the Saxons believed before the Normans came? Nobody knows because they haven't left any records. They've had, there's no written records and there's no archaeology either to show that they worshipped anything. So we know that they built things because people lived here. Yes. So can we date dwellings or places of commerce to their period? Yes, I mean there are uh, villages, possibly towns that they lived in. It's very difficult to say because they didn't really leave very much behind at all. In mainland Europe, if we go to Saxony, if we go to northern Germany, which is the, the real heartland of where these people came from, 
Do we have anything attested to that sort of period to show, or even earlier, obviously, their forefathers, what they believed in, where they congregated, or anything of that nature? Well, you'd have to ask a German historian. They have got their, in fact, Germany sort of really started the whole idea of sort of folklore and everything. They got very enthusiastic, uh, especially in the 18th and 19th century, about collecting uh, sort of a, you know ancient poems and ballads and so on. Um, I suppose the answer is that you haven't really got any records before well, before, certainly not before the Romans, and um, it's all a bit, it, there's a whole period after the Romans when each country just sort of established itself, not, not as a nation state as we would know it today, but uh, we would sort of recognise some of the countries anyway. So these scriptures effectively the documents of of entitlement were fabricated all over the place as a means to give rights to the church and if the church had rights to the land which was the wealth of the of the of the countries at the time then obviously being sort of the right hand side of the, of the monarch of the serving monarch by default they had power over the people and therefore control in certain areas of the state in the name of the king and the name of God and whatever, because they've got that kind of paper record. So yeah. they were effectively rewriting history to suit their need to prove claim and then claim entitlement. Yes. So what we have then is a book which effectively shakes a lot of Western European nations and what we take, what they take for granted as part of their history, makeup of their culture and beliefs, and we are shaping them to their very core. Yes. <laughs> and is it possible then that the people that they have superseded, we were talking about the Saxons, may never have existed at all? What, the Saxons, you mean? Yeah. It is more than possible. I'd say it's very likely because they're so... Nobody actually knows where they came from. They say, oh, they came from Jutland and Friesland and everything. But there's no evidence. And the problem is, there's no evidence of their language either. Nobody speaks Anglo-Saxon except apparently Anglo-Saxons in England. But they didn't speak it anywhere else. So it's, it's a pretty ludicrous situation. So going on potentially people who didn't exist and a construct of history which you obviously in some of the documents you, you reference in that book you then were involved in a subsequent book which was talking about entities, people or, or, or um, what was that term, persons that we take for granted have existed but in actual fact may not have existed and a great example is um, documents written by somebody like Samuel Pepys of London anyone who doesn't know he was somebody who kept a journal or diary and it's considered one of the great resources that we can look back on as to what uh, the great fire of london was like in in the up to and in the aftermath of that but of course that may not have existed or may have been plagiarized then we have historical people such as casanova who may not have existed so what was the thinking behind writing a book disproving who may or may not have been when you have uh, character who is said to be almost unique or oh, unique in fact and has contributed to our understanding of a whole century and you think well hang on you know what about everybody else you know why just this one character it doesn't make sense there should be lots of people all of a similar caliber doing exactly that. You know, why is there just one diary? Well, it turns out there wasn't one diary, there were two diaries. So Samuel Pepys wasn't the first. Uh, John Evelyn wrote a diary, apparently, 
and then two or three years later Pepys's diary was published but we're talking about 150 years after everything happened not contemporary documents so we're talking basically 19th century when these were actually published for something which happened midway through the 17th century you're talking yes you're talking about a long time gap and nobody ever seems to sort of wonder why there was such a long wait why would anybody be interested in events that happened all that time ago so the question would be in the case of a diary or in the case of this uh, this love rat or what a, what a for better term in terms of Casanova or anyone else in the book why does somebody want to invent a figure with all of this infamy attributed to them in, in some of their instances what is the benefit of having these almost larger than life characters or celebrities of the time what why were they created what was the point and why have people just taken it at face value for so long you mean like Casanova in the case of Casanova yes. you've got this infamous person who was a bit of a love rat or in the case of Samuel Pepys you've got this person who kept a diary about something which like you just said happened 150 years before so why the sudden intrigue or anyone else that's in the book you've got these these figures who have been created to serve a purpose why were they created and what would be the purpose and why would people just believe for so long that they existed without questioning them? Well, in the case of, let's say, Casanova, you are creating a, a I suppose, what you call a picaresque novel. So you take somebody who comes from a very humble background, just an ordinary Italian family, and he rises through the ranks and he meets all sorts of influential people, kings and queens and emperors and great philosophers. And then in the end, he just sort of sinks back into obscurity and dies in rather sad, sort of lonely. Didn't he also, is he also famous for the supposedly having to be conquest, shall we say? Yes. So it's, I suppose, it's not exactly pornographic, but it's, it's that sort of racy literature. It's very, it was very, very successful, very popular. So, in a sense, you are creating a character, but to give him a sort of an air of reality, you actually introduce him to some real historical figures. But of course, there's nothing, there's no, there's no evidence that, say, Voltaire ever met Casanova, even though Casanova says that he did. Or is Casanova written from a first person's point of view, like a diary, or is it a, a work of fiction? How how is it portrayed? No, it's it's supposed to be a an autobiography. He is supposed to have been writing in a castle in Bohemia, Castle Ducks. He was so right in the heart of Europe, yeah, basically. Yes. So he was. This was his as an old man. He was he was quite ill by this stage so as a sick old man he was writing his life story he like actually like memoirs yeah he calls it l'histoire de ma vie the story of my life so it's supposed to be an autobiography that's how it's presented but of course it's quite clear that a lot of it never couldn't have happened but it's great it's a role well, why, why do you say a lot of it couldn't have happened what, what what's the it's it's very improbable. You know, he escapes from uh, prison, the Doge's palace, he has, which nobody has ever escaped from before. By like, it's like Alcatraz of the ancient. Yeah, it's, it's sort of by gondola. You know, it's sort of, it's sort of they're very. I'm. It's great. For I ha have to admit, I have never read it because I ha actually have no particular interest in eighteenth century. Italian rakes, but I'm sure it's quite a fun read if you like that sort of thing. I mean, I just sort of found it rather boring, the idea of having to read it. But if you look at it from a historical point of view, you know, the the chances of him meeting all the sort of crowned heads of Europe get slimmer and slimmer. 
and he kept being arrested and thrown in prison and all sorts of scandals followed him around so you know it sort of didn't seem very likely he would mix in such sort of high up circles so is it effectively almost like a work of fiction to create some form of infamy to sell copies of a book what would be the is that that what it was, it was a yeah, commercial endeavor it was published by a company called Brockhaus German publishing company which is arguably the biggest publisher in the world and Brockhaus still exists Brockhaus was uh, famous for publishing encyclopedias and the work of Casanova uh, it actually is quite late the, the manuscript nobody actually saw the manuscript until the early 20th century so this is sold. this is something that was written that nobody has seen the light of day of and that's just took right. it as fact Brockhaus, Brockhaus kept it in apparently in the publisher's vaults and didn't allow anybody to see the manuscript but it kept getting published you had all these pirate versions of it and it would be translated from French into German and then back from German into French and then eventually into English and all these sort of pirate editions were appearing all over Europe so it, it was a a scandal a Success, a scandal, as they called it, a scandalous success, um, which you know did uh, did nobody nobody ever questioned whether he actually existed or not. So because it was doing so well, it was shipping so many copies, they just took it at face value, uh, basically in that instance. I think actually, I take it back. I think there have been a few people who have questioned whether he was. A real person or not there are pe but no most people would say oh yes of course he's a real person he met the Emperor and the, the King of Spain and the, you know um, all these famous people that he met <laughs> there's no actual um, evidence that he met any of them so with the rest of the people referenced in the book what is the what is the reason that they were created? What, what, who, who creates these people, these characters? What is the reason for that? And why do people for so long, okay, we've said, we've said about Casanova, there might have been some uh, disbelief before, but generally speaking, we seem to take these people in folklore, like you said before, as it having existed. Why were they created? What was, the, what was the purpose? And why have people just sort of sat there and blindly accepted it for so long? Well, something like Casanova would be for money. I mean, it, it was a huge su publishing success. So, you know, as we were saying with forged charters, you know, it, it's it's quite mercenary. It's not a, it's not nothing spiritual about it at all. So it's a cyn it's a cynical means of commercial gain. Well, yeah. I mean, about cynical. I mean, it, it's it's fair enough people like a good story but uh, you know to whether something is intentional or not you don't know I mean some things are intended to deceive like land charters other things like a book you don't know I mean it may well be that it was intended just to be an entertaining book and not necessarily supposed to be a real person at all. So <clears throat> taking into account that you've written about historically constructed great megaliths, you've written about parchments and stories and documents and historical figures for one of the historical figures for one of a better term. What's on the horizon for the next thing that you're looking to try and argue against or disprove? Is there anything else in the pipeline or in the works? Well all ideas would be very welcome if you have any thoughts of your own. <laughs> it's always, it has to be something that you think it doesn't sound quite right. You know, uh, it rings a few alarm bells and you just think, oh, how do they know that? And then you, s but often you start off with one thing and you end up with something completely different. You go herring after one idea 
and then you get sidetracked into something that actually turns out to be more interesting or more important. You don't necessarily end up where you, where you thought you were going to end up. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's the case with most things. But um, <coughs> what, what would be something that, or what has it got to be to incite um, either an emotional or a strong enough response to, to say, well, I don't believe what you're saying here, but then something else comes along and says, I don't believe you so much that I actually want to go ahead and then try and disprove it. What would be the, the threshold or what is that, that hook? Is it the, is it the fact the, the, the amount of time that something has been purported? Is it the importance or the relevance? Or is it just a personal interest that makes you want to question it? I think it's, yeah, like most people, I suspect, you don't like being fooled. You don't like the idea that you've been taken for a ride. But then the problem is if everybody, I say everybody, not everybody, but the vast majority of people also believe something, it's very difficult to go against the tide. So it, it, it's got to be something that you feel Im is important enough or interesting enough because you don't make a lot of friends along the way. People don't really like you coming up to them and saying, by the way, I don't agree with you. In fact, I think you're wrong, even though they, at least on paper, have far more experience and have done far more research than you have. It, they don't like to admit that they've been wrong either. And it's hard. But I think it's exciting as well because I think you've got to be curious enough about something to want to look into it further. And you've got to think it's important too. So something like say Casanova, I think is relatively trivial. You know, so what if he wasn't a real person? I don't think many people will care about that. But when you get on to other things, like a whole chunk of history that you've been taught about, and it's shown, well, I'm sorry, but there's no documentary evidence and there's no archaeological evidence, so how can you say this, that, or the other happened? Then it gets a little bit harder to uh, convince people because they care much more about it. I have to say the similarities between the topics that you cover in the book and what we see now with fake news are quite striking. You have a narrative, you have a medium, you have people who stand to gain and they're trying to spout some form of story perhaps with little or no research or proof yet they still expect that everyone to buy into it and I have to say that the biggest thing to take away from each of the books is the fact that they are thought-provoking and they do make you question what you are being told and they do present very credibly that by going back and thinking logically and having a look at how disjointed the dots to dots that convention would have you believe actually aren't connected at all in exactly the same way that anyone on social media wants you to not believe what the mass media puts out into the ether there's a lot of similarities there so to continue the vein of people just not blindly believing what they're told to challenge this whole rhetoric of fake news, I would highly recommend that people read the book, if anything, to get their mind in tune with just challenging and not believing what they're just spoon-fed. And even if they draw their own conclusions, hopefully it whets the appetite for people to just do their own research or form their own conclusions without necessarily just blindly taking on what they're, what they're fed. That would be wonderful. That would be really heartening because you don't necessarily have to be right all the time. That's not the point. The point is you've got to think about things and you might decide to accept some, some or all or none. But you've got to be allowed to voice your opinion and not to be squashed flat simply because you don't agree with the powers that be. It happens all the time. I've done a number of episodes when it covers various sporting or news related items and whether or not you agree, the opinion and the logic and the substantiation behind your opinion is arguably more important than the opinion that you, you come to at the end. I'll include the links, or I have included the links um, in the description. So if anyone's interested in getting a copy, 
um, whether it be from Amazon or anywhere else, I will include the links on there. But um, thank you very much for coming to, to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for asking me. Thank you.